Greetings, greenhouse people, and welcome to another episode of Tech on Demand, brought to you by Grower Talks. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and our goal here is to help you grow your best crop ever by sharing cultural and technical information based on discussions with experts around the globe, although sometimes we'll cover other topics in the horticulture realm like nursery and retail. This time, we're joined by Dr. Todd Cavins. Todd's one of the technical services experts at Ball Seed and has been helping professional growers solve greenhouse production challenges for more than 10 years in the field. And before that, he was a professor at Oklahoma State University. He earned his MS focused on cut flowers and flowering induction and his PhD in plant nutrition and soil. With more than 15 years experience traveling North America and around the world, working with growers of all shapes, sizes, and flavors, Todd's a trusted source when it comes to researching and advising the real-world problems that affect daily plant production. Problems like sanitation. And that's the topic of the day. I've actually seen the hashtag posted around hort circles, start clean, stay clean. And we all know that's true. But does your greenhouse really have a sanitation plan? You don't have to answer that. But you do have to listen all the way to the end of this episode because Todd covers a lot. From how growers, especially managers, traffic pests, to best practices for keeping greenhouses clean, Todd takes us from spring cleanup through crop production in all stages to help determine where problems lie and, most importantly, how to clean them up. So without further ado, let's do this thing. Ball Tech On Demand, Greenhouse Sanitation. Todd, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bill. Thanks. It's great to be with you today. So our topic for today is greenhouse sanitation and specifically how it relates to pests and diseases. So when when we were talking about topics to, to approach, this one certainly came up high on the list. Why do you think that this topic is of particular importance to our to our listener audience? Well, Bill, I think it's really important because it's one of those topics, it's one of those activities in the greenhouse that touches almost every a- other aspect that we need to handle in the greenhouse. You know, if you have a good, clean operation, you're going to have a good, clean operation, and that's critical to good plant health, that's critical to getting crops out on time, and that's critical to making money with these crops. So it's just one of those overarching things that we have to have. We have to have good, healthy plants in order to be a successful operation. And to me, sanitation of our facilities and our people, it's a key starting point. Excellent. I think that that really sets the stage and puts it in perspective. It is uh, involved, you know, sanitation is something that that is related to every aspect of greenhouse production. and Everybody wants to create the best crop that they possibly can. So I'm interested in any horror stories or, or anything you've seen in the field <laughs> that, uh, you know, just just to get to get the ball rolling and have a little fun. To start oh, with. well, I, I've seen a few horror stories out there. That's for sure. Um, you know, w- one that comes to mind, I guess, is uh, years, a few years back, a customer contacted me and said they were having a horrible problem with spider mites. Now, this was in December. They were getting uh, they were getting sweet potato cuttings in very early to get started, to get in hanging baskets, get them big, get them growing early for the spring season. And so, you know, spider mites in December, that just didn't make sense to me. So I went and visited them. We talked about all their production and how it all worked and, you know, where the, where the cuttings came in from, this, that, and the other. And so we started walking through the greenhouse. And they were telling me about, you know, when I started these plants, I put them in the containers and I set them down here over on the floor. And at this particular floor, it was a small operation. They had individual Kwanzaa greenhouses. And to get plants up off of the bare soil, they had them plants sitting on wooden pallets. So, but by the time I got there, the plants were up and hanging up. But we started and we looked back and we were kind of tracing back the problem. Where's the problem starting? Where's it starting? And we looked down and these wooden pallets are filled with debris. They've got leaves and and things from past crops from blowing in the greenhouse when the doors were open during the off season and things like this. It was that debris down in those pallets where those plants were sitting on top of that debris was essentially a breeding ground, a nursery 
or pest and disease problems. And so that's where we isolated or kind of worked our way back towards and found out where was the root of the problem. This was a pest problem from the previous year that the grower inadvertently overwintered because they did not clean out their greenhouse. So I've seen that more than once. Um, you know, it, it, we sometimes are our own worst enemy in the greenhouse. And in this case, the just not getting the, the house cleaned out as good as it should have been was the problem there. And that makes sense because they've spent so much time looking at the plants and the crop and focusing on getting those those cuttings up and, and the baskets up that they didn't even look down. And <laughs> yeah. we oftentimes, yeah, we concentrate too much on the plants sometimes. It's the facilities and the people that uh, are often the problem. And I challenge any listener to look around your greenhouse because I guarantee there's a dirty pallet somewhere. I don't think I've ever been in a greenhouse that didn't have a dirty pallet somewhere. Yeah, that's for sure. So how about how about humans? Because I know that um, that's another uh uh, uh, thing that's present in every single greenhouse is humans. So how are humans responsible for many of the greenhouse pest and disease issues and how do, how do we make them worse? Yeah. Well, I was uh, talking to uh, one of the technical folks at one of the production farms down in Central America and I was talking to them about, you know, disease prevention and pest prevention and what the history has said over the time. And one of the things they found out is that it was the supervisors, the managers were the ones that were most likely to transmit diseases from one greenhouse to the other because they're moving around. And so it made me think, yeah, we humans, we're, we're the ones moving it around. You know, if we touch plants, we've got, you know, plant residues and, and things on our hands, uh, reaching over and digging into a bench, you know, we get uh, our, our sleeves, our, our arms touch the crops and if we don't have really good practices, sanitation protocol in between greenhouses, we end up being the vectors of pests and disease as the humans that move from house to house, from one into the other. Uh, so that's oftentimes how we get uh, plant pest and diseases spread over a wide area. It's actually us. It's not the pest itself. I mean, certainly the pest is the problem, but we're, we're, we're certainly helping them out by moving great distances from one house to the other. That's for sure. And in most operations, I mean, you, you do have a lot of the, the team moving from greenhouse to greenhouse to greenhouse. It's it's only in a lot of the larger operations where you have, you know, one person responsible for a, an environment or a zone. Most of the time it is multiple people going from greenhouse to greenhouse. So it makes sense that that would be a, a pretty, pretty good vector for disease and pests. Yeah, absolutely. But even in those big greenhouses, what I've found it's where they have those consolidated production and transplanting, maybe uh, propagation areas. You know, you still end up having a lot of people touching a lot of different plants that go to a lot of different places, even at big operations. So, you know, the tools and the people at those in those areas of the greenhouse are critical. So if you have a propagation area or your tra a transplanting area or sticking area, boy, that's where I would start to concentrate on sanitation of, of my people and my tools that are touching the plant. Okay, and as we as we sort of wrap up where we're setting the stage for uh, for for the sanitation topic, what about insects? Because we talked about humans being a vector for disease, but I know that insects also can be. So, how often are diseases spread by insects in a greenhouse setting, and what can you tell us about that? Well, we definitely know that insects are a problem. Insects and arthropod pests do spread diseases. I mean, it's pretty classic and well known that thrips carry INSV, impatience necrotic spot virus. Um, you know, we see that. That's usually a minor occurrence each year. Um, and so controlling thrips is critical for controlling virus. You look to fungus gnats. We used to think that fungus gnats transmit Pythium and Phytophthora. Some of our uh, recent research, I believe it was Cornell University did that, actually found out that wasn't the case. But what the fungus gnats did transmit were things like Thalaviopsis, Fusarium, and Verticillium. So while it may not be the most common diseases that we deal with, uh, they often go hand in hand because the same environment that's good for fungus gnats is also good for Pythium and Phytophthora. But nonetheless, those fungus gnats can transmit some other diseases, you know, and or for those of us that may be growing vegetable crops, food crops, um, you know, that's something we've got to be aware of as well. One of the outbreaks of disease problem in uh, some of our finished produce production a few years back was actually um, attributed to flies transmitting E. coli from a nearby dairy farm 
to a vegetable production field. So yeah, those insects, they are problematic. So the insect control, disease control, they go hand in hand. And it all comes right back to cleanliness. So talk, let's talk a little bit about best practices and just some, some ground rules for keeping a greenhouse as clean as possible to help avoid some of these uh, problems that you've already uh, told us about. Sure. Well, if you refer back to that story I started with, um, you know, what makes me think about it is when do, I, when do I do this sanitation? And sanitation is a year round, day in, day out, constant process. OK, so it's got to, you know, <clears throat> right now is, uh, we're recording this just before our spring season starting to kick off. So absolutely get out there and do deep cleaning on the greenhouses. Make sure all debris is removed. You know, do some whatever sa- sanitation protocol you feel is appropriate. But, you know. Once that crops in there, you're also picking up any debris. You are keeping things as clean as possible on a re- regular basis. If you are picking off plant parts, say pinching or removing flower buds, if you throw those in the trash can, it's getting that trash can covered and it's getting that trash taken out on a regular basis so we don't essentially create a disease and pest nursery in our trash can. Because guess what? There's going to gonna somehow, some way, that's going to get out of that trash can back into the greenhouse. So. Again, it's year round, it's constant, and it start. It never stops. It never stops is what I should say. It should be constant in your mind. And I've been in many greenhouses with full trash cans after they've uh, been pinching. I mean, I, I've seen it a, a million <laughs> times. Those trash cans are overflowing, and and I think it's great that some of the some of the most simple solutions, such as empty your trash cans. Uh, you know, check it, you know, check daily, pick up all debris, you know, maybe make that a, a protocol for your team before they leave every day is, you know, clean your room before you leave for school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really got to become part of your culture as a company. I think, you know, you've got to have a clean culture and, you know, that starts with the leadership act- out there leading by example. Uh, but it just becomes part of it. Hey, we will run a clean operation. That will be a key to our success. Excellent. So let's let's go a little bit deeper into the sanitation and cleanup, because I know just from talking to you and and certainly reading articles throughout the years, it needs to start before plants begin arriving for spring production. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Start clean, stay clean. You hear that a lot. That's that's really true. Excellent. Excellent. Is there are there any um, kind of problem areas that, that you see when you visit greenhouses? Are there any. You know, for, for folks listening, are there are there places they should start first um, or 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 sort of secret hiding spots for the pests and diseases or some of these tran- transmitted problems? Yeah, as I mentioned a few moments ago, anytime you have a concentration of plants and people and a lot of handling, that's where I would start. So that's that transplanting. That's that sticking area for propagation, the sowing area, those places. You know, there's just a lot of opportunity for touching and spreading of disease and pests there. So start there. But once we get out in the greenhouse, what should we look at? You know, when it comes to uh, especially pest, insect pest, one of the areas we see this is it tends to be the warm areas and those areas near vents and doorways. So those are often areas I suggest folks, hey, on your scouting program, pay extra close attention to these areas because you'll often see those hot spots uh, pick up a little bit. Um, so, you know, one of the best things you can do is have, you know, ensure that you've got good closures on your vents and doors so that pests can't easily sneak underneath them or through the cracks. Uh, so that would be very important. Um, if an area needs to be closed off or if you can close off, you know, areas of your greenhouse and <laughs> maybe even limit some of your human traffic from one area to the other just by putting up a rope or something. Hey, Follow this pathway. Don't cut through the benches. You know, just something to keep folks from touching and getting near those plants. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, when it comes to people in the greenhouse, what you know, you talked a little bit about um, people, you know, going from greenhouse to greenhouse and maybe not disinfecting uh, as properly as they should. When it comes to people in the greenhouse, what are the best ways to to keep to keep a sanitary environment? Um, you know, it would be good to kind of close off those areas if you can. But when people are kind of roaming, roaming free through the greenhouse, what are some best ways to maintain that sanitary environment? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go back and I'll uh, I'll 
share with you what I've seen at some of the big production farms in Central America where a lot of these stock plants are grown, where, you know, this disease management, these, these farms do a great job. And for those people who do have to go from greenhouse to greenhouse, um, you'll always see them wearing gloves. They'll always have a sanitation solution for with them. And so every few minutes, there's actually an alarm that goes off at most of these big farms. So every four to five minutes, you'll hear an alarm go off. The people actually treat their gloved hands with a disinfectant. OK, so that's a great tip and trick. What they also do is they have um, certain lab coats or clothing that only remains in that greenhouse. So we, I mentioned earlier, you know, reaching across a bench, your sleeve will get, gather the pest or disease on it and you transmit it to another. So that's one of the ways they prevent it as well is they actually change their clothing from one greenhouse to another. So. You know, that may be not be completely practical for everybody, but it's something sure to think about. Absolutely. And, and certainly following a protocol and making sure that your whole team's on board with that makes a lot of sense. And um, certainly gloves are cheap. It's something that, that every greenhouse can put into place. And then, you know, even if it's not lab coats, but maybe having some sort of uh, a coat or, you know, a shirt or something you put on when you go in and out of a specific greenhouse, especially where there, there's a high risk, I think makes a lot of sense. So learn from the production farms that are certainly extremely attentive to uh, disease uh, management protocols. And uh, I think you can definitely pick up some good ideas from there. So when you talk about, when you think about the greenhouse structure itself, are there effective pest barriers? Are there are there actual structural or, or products that that you can buy to to help keep the greenhouse uh, clean from from pest problems? Sure, sure. And I mentioned earlier, you know, good seals on doors and vents and things like that are important. Um, you know, um, I've also seen just some plastic barriers put between uh, bays of larger gutter connected greenhouses that help stop some of the the transmission. Um, you know, <clears throat> actually a piece of plastic that's only about uh, a couple of feet higher than the bench or where the plant surfaces are or some sticky tape along uh, in between those barriers can really do a good job of helping slow uh, the, the pest from moving around. Also, is a good way to, you know, monitor those and see if you've got any uh, pest in the area, just ha having some sticky tape and cards up between those areas. So that's one way you can do it. <clears throat> Another thing that we've seen in a lot of facilities over the years is insector screening that's on the exterior of the greenhouse that goes around the entryways, that goes over the vents and things like that. There's kind of two schools of thought on that. Um, some recent research from the Netherlands actually said, well, those aren't quite as effective as we thought, uh, but there's still a lot of people that find good use in them. I can tell you that uh, visiting a lot of the facilities are, uh, in the Ball Horticultural Company, we still use a lot of that uh, because we <laughs> we just feel it's a it's a good practice. It causes some concern with greenhouse design. You know, it's harder to get air movement through those types of things. But um, that is, you know, insect barriers on the exterior of your greenhouse is definitely one of those things you can look at. And there are some newer developments, you know, that tend to do a little bit better job than the insect screening of the past. So um, take a look at those and that may be something that's appropriate. But one of the things you do want to consider is I visited a greenhouse a few years back and they were actually taking theirs off and they complained that they actually were trapping insects in. They did not have a good, robust pest management program. They had pests constantly in their greenhouse, so they were trapping the bad guys on the inside. So it can work against you if you aren't maintaining a good program. So we'll we'll assume for this discussion that 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 the greenhouse does have a good program, and then it, in that in that case, it definitely seems like the plastic barriers, even insect screening. I mean, it, it's it's almost like you're you're better safe than sorry with a product like that. You'll you'll figure out the the movement of air in the environment, um, and it'll probably uh, pay off to have some sort of barrier screening um, when it comes to to sanitation. Yes. So how about chemical cleaners and disinfectants? I mean, I've seen every all sorts of different products used um, at certain times of the year. Are there uh, cleaners or disinfectants or disinfestants that you've seen to be particularly effective? Yeah, I you know, I don't want to necessarily promote a, promote a specific brand or anything like that. There's lots of good products out there. So let's talk about the system. Um, if you go to several of the web pages of uh, companies that sell equipment, 
to um, distribute the chemicals or the chemicals themselves, you'll hear a lot about or read a lot about always clean before disinfecting. And this kind of goes again, goes back to that earlier story I told you about the, the debris and the pallets. You've got to get the greenhouse or this area clean first of the debris. So you got to get the physical debris removed. OK, and then a really popular thing that we've been seeing in the past few years is the use of acidified soaps prior to disinfecting. So you remove the physical debris, then you go in and wash. Now these soaps are pretty heavy duty and like they, I said, they're acidic so they can be corrosive. So you've really got to follow the instructions on them appropriately. But by using that acidified soap, it does a couple of things. It starts to break down any waxy layers of any pest uh, that are out there, but the acid part breaks down mineral buildup, which also can harbor. Um, you think about, uh, you know, like a lime deposit on your faucet, you know, those little pores in there, disease can get in there and reside in there. And having the acid part of that soap dissolves that. And then after you rinse that acid soap off, you can go, go in there with a disinfectant or disinfectant of your choice. Um, you know, there's a couple of different strategies with that. Uh, the quaternary ammonium group, um, these are really popular. Um, there's a few out there that even tout, and it looks to be true, that they have some better longevity. So you spray them on, those you don't rinse off. And even as they sit there and dry, the dry components of that chemical actually are still disinfecting as it rewets or disease gets on there. So those are really good and potent. And those, again, are the quaternary ammoniums. <laughs> Okay. The those other kind of other good, good ideas. Yeah. The, there's another kind of group of chemicals, and I'm not. Uh, bear in mind, I'm not a chemistry person per se or a sanitation expert, but this other group of chemicals I call the oxidizers, and these are kind of like the peroxides. These chemicals have been around for quite a few years, but there's kind of been a newer generation of these come out in the past five or six years or so, and they've gone in and they've stabilized them. So they put some stabilizer chemicals so that they last longer and are more effective. So, And they also, there's quite a few of these that are allowed in organic production. So if that's a concern of yours, look to some of those products. And I would say, you know, both the quaternary ammoniums and the oxidizers, there are some application techniques that are worth looking into. Both of these, when you're applying them to porous surfaces, let's think about a porous concrete floor. You know, if you just spray them on, they just kind of get there and, well, they hit the floor and, and that's that. But if you will use a foaming applicator, you know, it gets this nice frothy foam and the foam goes over the floor and that foam has a good long contact time. You know, it just doesn't rinse away or, or um, streak away easily. It stays there, long contact time, also has a little bit of lifting action. So check out foamers and see if those might be good for you. You get a lot better uh, control with your foaming agents. That's excellent. I think that there's the products you can use and then there's the techniques you can use to apply. You've got to absolutely consider both. You started with removing debris, which you've mentioned any number of times through our discussion here. I think, you know, when you, you, you look around, especially uh, this time of year, there's a lot of leaves blowing around. You know, you're raking your, your yard every week, and that certainly can also impact your greenhouse. When things blow in through those doors, open up your dock doors, you're going to end up with stuff blowing in. So keeping an eye on the debris and then looking uh, to these various uh, different disinfectants, I think, is a, is a good plan. And now is really the time to do it. And uh, I'm sure if you talk to your uh, to the companies you buy uh, chemicals from in any distribution company, they're going to have some ideas um, that are, that are going to be good for your operation. Absolutely. Hey, one thing I'd like to add on that, you know, that that cleaning before disinfecting, that's kind of a before the plants are there. But let's not forget while the plants are in the greenhouse, we still have to be diligent and keeping clean. So if you have the opportunity, say you have you clear out a bench, you know, you're ready to put your next turn of crops in there before you put that next turn of crops. Let's get in there and, and clean that bench, you know, remove debris, use a sanitizer, that type of thing. Also, during your crop. There's some products out there that are these oxidizing agents that are actually in granular form. I've seen a few growers that have used fertilizer spreaders and where they actually go and spread these granules, these oxidizer granules, under their bench for algae and control. And so that's really done a good job of when you prevent the algae, you prevent the fungus gnats. So 
Think about those opportunities even while you have some crops in the greenhouse. There are, in some of these um, sanitizing or disinfecting agents, they actually have labeled rates for over-the-top applications on plants. So now keep in mind, if you do that, if you do if you use too high of a concentration, they are definitely toxic to the plants. So you will you can burn some plants easily. And when you use them at those lower, safer rates, um, you know, you don't get this dramatic cleanup, so to speak. So that it, those are those lower rates are long term solutions and don't expect a dramatic turnaround to do that. Get those dramatic turnarounds. We've got to do the do those clean out procedures while the plants are not in the greenhouse. I think adding in a sanitation protocol between turns makes a lot of sense. That seems like something that, that any greenhouse could build into their production scheduling. Yeah, it's tough. I know it's because that's when <laughs> the <laughs> plant growing season is crazy and you can't find another minute. But man, think about that. If we clean that out before we ever got the plants in there, how much easier it would be? We'd save money not only on the, the fungicides, but uh, we just prevent it from ever happening in the first place. Yeah, and you're going to potentially save future chemical costs. You're going to reduce shrink. And I think it has, uh, it sounds like a lot of tangible benefits. So how effective can a good sanitation protocol be? I mean, I, you're, you're never going to completely eliminate the risk of pests and disease. But if you're keeping your greenhouse clean, if you're following some of these best practices you've laid out, what kind of effectiveness can a, can a grower look for? I will say it can be very effective. And I'll, I'll mention, you know, a big struggle that many of us had. We had a big di disease outbreak in the industry, industry years ago, right? People lost a lot of crops. It was tough. But one of the good outcomes of that is we learned a lot about sanitation practices. And so as I was out there and observing the experts and how they recommended to do sanitation and things, as I followed up with growers, one of the things they commented on is, I have hardly any fungus gnats this year. I have hardly any thrips this year. It was one of those tragic episodes where everybody really went out and cleaned up really well that actually we saw a decrease in pest problems, insect pest problems the following year. So, yes, it can be very effective. Sanitation not only kills the diseases, but it prevents those areas where those pests thrive and, and overwinter for us. So it can be very effective. Excellent. That, that's really good to hear. I think that that um, puts a lot of this into perspective. So we're going to wrap up here. Do you have any final tips and tricks that listeners can share with their teams to stay as clean and disease free as possible? Anything we haven't covered? Anything you want to you want to add here at the end? Well, you know, we mentioned it a little bit, but one of the things we didn't mention is when your workers come in to start the day. I said the, I mentioned the phrase earlier, start clean, stay clean. Think about that. We dealt with a disease problem at one of our customers a few years ago, and we were never actually to definitely pinpoint where it came from. But the best we could figure out, it was actually a worker who brought the disease in on their hands from working in their own home garden. So when your workers come in, think about getting them washed up. Think about them not using their they're, they're outside the greenhouse coat and clothing on the inside. So maybe, like you said, they have a dedicated jacket at, that they just use at work. They wash up when they come in and they are using gloves if they're going to be ones that are touching the plants on a regular basis. I love that. It's like working at a restaurant. You always see those signs that say, wash your hands before returning to work. I think that there, there's no reason why you can't put those signs in your washrooms and around uh, break room, time clock that says, be sure to wash up before you start your day. Um, yeah, it's probably absolutely. Uh, something that you can uh, ingrain into the heads of, of your team members um, from all, all the way from top to bottom and probably is a fantastic piece of advice to wrap this up. So thank you very much, Todd. I think you've given us a lot of uh, food for thought here, probably uh, uh, inspired a lot of people to create kind of a spring cleaning list to go and look for uh, some of those hot spots in the greenhouse, pick up those pallets, rake up those leaves, you know, throw out, throw out that trash on time. Don't let it sit there overnight. And uh, you'll probably be pretty surprised at, at, at the results you'll see when it comes to reducing pest and disease. So once again, thank you so much, Todd. And I look forward to talking to you again. All right, Bill. Thanks so much.